Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Miguel Farias. He is an associate professor at Coventry University in the UK. His work explores the psychological impact of beliefs and spiritual practices, including meditation and pilgrimage. He is also interested in the biological roots of our beliefs and how we can change them and is the author of the book, The Buddha Pill, Can Meditation Change You? And we're going to focus mostly on that book today. So, uh, Dr. Farias, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. Delightful to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so in your book, you go through several different uh, practices that people have uh, uh, in which they, t- they try to have some positive psychological effects on their minds, let's say. Uh, and you talk about things like, for example, <clears throat> meditation, yoga, mindfulness, and things like that. So maybe the first question I, I would ask you is, um, what are these practices about? Because, I mean, it isn't the case that when people talk about either meditation or mindfulness, that they are always doing the exact same thing, right? And that's Mm. maybe a problem when you and other people are doing psychological research on the impacts that these practices have at a psychological level. Right. Yes, that's that's a very important question, and you are absolutely right. So these meditation techniques also sometimes are even more often called contemplation techniques mm-hmm. have been used for, I mean, f- for a while, and most of them have really been developed within the world religions or spiritual traditions, from Hinduism, Judaism to Christianity and Islam. So all these religions have developed some kind of techniques to essentially change people's state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And and the aims vary considerably, although, I mean, for some of these traditions, the aim would be to get closer to to God. Mm -hmm. For other religions, it would be to, to have some kind of enlightenment. But there's all sorts of possibilities. They have also been used to attain longer life, even the idea of physical immortality, Mm -hmm. to achieve some supernatural powers, such as telepathy or even levitation. So, and and of course, they vary quite widely from just focusing on your breath, focusing on a religious image, focusing on the stream of consciousness, such as with mindfulness, or just chanting together with with other people that's that's also very very common so there's there's a huge variety starting with the 1920s 1930s there have been some medical psychological uses of these techniques they were first called relaxation techniques but Back then, so the 19, when Jacobson did his first book on relaxation methods, his aim was already to take out from these religious traditions some techniques, in, in his case, very, very focused on, on the body and on relaxation of the muscles throughout the body. But his aim was already to bring this out of the religious traditions and make it more secular so that it could be used by medical practitioners. And his technique, of course, became one of the standard techniques used by cognitive uh, behavior therapists until now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I mean, it's a problem if these practices are not standardized because it becomes really difficult, at least most of the time, to really know uh, what are the sorts of things that we're studying here, and also if they really have 
a clear effect on people's minds or if it's just some kind of placebo or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a very important question. So there have been attempts at standardizing some of these techniques. Mm -hmm. The first case was with transcendental meditation. This became very popular in the late 60s and throughout the 70s and, and 80s. Actually, one of the things we say in the book is that my own interest in meditation started out when my own parents did a course on transcendental meditation in Lisbon, Portugal. This was something very brief, but it was my first contact with, with the world of, of meditation. So, so transcendental meditation, TM, standardized the method. Mm -hmm. Not only standardized the method, but it was the first meditation movement that put it to the test in terms of psychophysiological, psychological tests to try to understand what are the effects of these techniques. In, in that sense, uh, probably transcendental meditation is the best example of a standardized meditation technique with, with one detail, which is that there's a variation. So, sorry, let, let me just go back because some, some people may not know what, what it consists of. Mm -hmm. So, you, you're supposed to sit down in a relaxed chair, comfortable position, and just focus on a mantra. So, focus on, on a, a syllable, which is supposed to be a, a sacred Sanskrit syllable, for 20 minutes, twice a day. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. So the issue is that this, the mantra, the syllable that people are focusing on, varies. There's, there's some variations, and we, we're not entirely sure how many, but possibly less than 10. I, I've heard from interviewing people who do TM. Now, the thing is, they say that this, this is an individual mantra, and they cannot share it. So it's never become accessible to the scientific literature, what exactly is the, the word they're focusing on. But there have been fascinating studies trying to tease out if it is any different to do TM focusing on this sacred word or just focusing and repeating the word one. The, um, the Eastern writer Krishnamurti used to make fun that it didn't make any difference saying Om or Om Shanti Om or just Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola. Uh, but, but he liked to be ironic about these things. But in, in, that, in that particular study where people were just saying to themselves one versus the TM group saying a, a word, it didn't, it didn't really make a difference. Anyway, so, so TM would be the, the first example of a standardized meditation technique. Then we have the mindfulness movement. And it started out with one program, uh, so Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness-based stress reduction. And, and his effort already then was to try to come up with something that could then just be used in the same way in different places. Uh, so in that way, it is also a kind of standardized program, mm -hmm. although it, it does include quite a lot of greater variety of techniques. So it starts, there's things like focusing on the breath and before you move into focusing on your stream of consciousness, letting go of this. But he's also introduced some, within the program, some things which are more similar to physical postures of yoga. Mm -hmm. and, and from his model then, others popped up, others were developed, such as the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And so they have their own program, which was originally developed for people who, who have had at least three episodes of depression. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so there have been these attempts at standardizing. However, even with mindfulness, Kabat-Zinn has given different definitions of what mindfulness is. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's an ongoing debate to what an extent 
people are doing the same thing or different things. And then there is another debate about to what an extent different people react differently to these techniques. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a whole world that needs to be explored on what we call individual differences, how people react differently to this. So, yeah. so there, there's also an element of individual variation and probably variation at the level of personality that also plays a role in the effects that those kinds of practices have on people? I could say with, with great certainty that yes, although there's very little literature, we're actually right now finishing a, a meta-analysis looking at precisely at individual differences in, in meditation. And we're looking at different things, not just not just personality, but some thing, basic things like age, gender, social economic status. Let me just give you two examples that we know from the literature. So people who have had recurrent depression and have done mindfulness, this program of mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, the ones that have better results are those with a higher incidence of trauma in their childhood. Mm -hmm. So that's one example. So if you have a high level of childhood trauma and you have had recurrent depression, you're better off using this than other people who don't have such a high incidence of childhood trauma. Another interesting result from, from a, a couple of studies is that people who are the most stressed also seem to react better some of these interventions than just people who are moderately stressed. Actually, if you're mo just moderately stressed or anxious, mindfulness techniques don't seem to work in, I mean, particularly well. Mm -hmm. However, if you're highly stressed, it seems to work much better. And uh, does it also have anything to do with uh, people's expectations, that is, what people expect to obtain by practicing mindfulness, for example, the, uh, could that uh, also play a role or have an influence on the effects that it has on them? Oh, uh, almost, almost certainly. So the, um, and there's few studies looking at expectations of the, the results of doing meditation and particularly mindfulness because it has become I mean, so widely spread in the media that people think that this is really going to, to work wonders. But, um, I mean, just to give you an example of another meta-analysis that we did in our lab, in which we're looking at the effects of meditation techniques on pro-sociality. If people felt or acted in a more empathic, compassionate way, or if they had lower levels of aggression, or prejudice after doing these meditation techniques. Um, so what we found out was that th there was a kind of weak to moderate effect, but then when we looked specifically at how meditation is affecting something like compassion, mm -hmm. we realized that there were experimental effects because so the, the positive effects were biased mm -hmm. by things like the teacher of the meditation intervention being a co-author in the published paper. Mm -hmm. So, which means that it's not just people's own expectations, but the expectations of the people conducting the experiments that also play a role mm -hmm. in, in changing how people react to these interventions. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there was, just to give you another example, there was an earlier study conducted in the 1970s by, um, I mean, back then, Jonathan Smith was a PhD student. And so he devised a whole manual for a placebo meditation, mm. right? So he just basically gave a lecture convincing people that there was this new wonderful meditation technique, that it was better than all the others. Mm -hmm. But as a matter of fact, the, the only thing that he told people to do was to sit down in a quiet, dark room and just not do anything, but they could think about whatever they wanted. And so he first looked at this for three months compared to a meditation technique, and there were no differences. They were both doing better than people who were doing 
just in the control group. Mm -hmm. So he thought this, perhaps he needed to do three more months. So he did another three months, and again, he got the same effects, mm -hmm. which, again, suggests that just by telling people that this is a great meditation technique and this is going to make you feel much better, it does, it, it might have an effect. Mm -hmm. So, and in terms of the studies that we have out there uh, on mindfulness and meditation, for example, um, what are what is the quality of these studies? I mean, are there a lot of, for example, randomized control trials? Do people use uh, control groups often? And uh, what are the quality of, uh, in general, the design of these studies? Because yes. as, far, as far as I understand or I know, uh, there aren't a lot of high quality studies out there on mindfulness and meditation, right? So, you're absolutely right. And whenever we, we do meta analysis, I mean, it's only a tiny percentage of the mm -hmm. studies that, that are used. So someone who did a major tri meta analysis of the uses of meditation for medical and psychological purposes, there was just a tiny percentage of studies that he could use. So the vast majority of studies are not randomized controlled trials and are, well, and, and its quality I mean, varies considerably. But I, I have to say that, um, in, that in this respect, studies on mindfulness are not an exception in the sense that most psychological studies are not randomized controlled trials. It's mm -hmm. and um, so their quality is is dubious and mm -hmm. yeah. But so you you, you are right that um, there's more and more. I mean, there's more and more people doing randomized controlled trials. Um, but the vast proportion of the literature is of dubious quality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are the effects and in what types of situations do you get them the, um, in regards to mindfulness, for example, uh, that we could say are really solid effects, solid psychological effects? I, I wouldn't like to use the word uh, proven or say that they... Uh, are proven effects, because that's very controversial to say in science, but are, are there any solid psychological effects that we get through mindfulness? So, so far, th there are some areas in which mindfulness in particular seems to work particularly well, such as for recurrent depression, so for people who have had at least three episodes of depression. And the problem with this is that we know from the literature on depression that if you've had three or more episodes of depression, the probability of having another one is just I mean, very, very high. Mm -hmm. If you've just had one or two, it's, it's, it's just not as high as if you've had three or more. It's, it's as if your, your mind somehow learns how to become depressed, if you can say that, I mean, met a bit metaphorically. So it's just much, much easier when you're faced with adversity to move back into that area, to that zone. And, um, and, and people like Mark Williams, who developed mindfulness for the treatment of, of recurrent depression, I mean, they were experts on, on the psychological, particularly cognitive behavior treatment of depression. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why this has become particularly effective for those individuals, because they already knew the field very well. So right now, for instance, in the UK, within the NHS, it's, it has become one of the standard treatments, because it seems to be as good as other forms of psychotherapy or even psychopharmacology. Mm -hmm. uh, so having said this, it's not, it's not a magic pill in the sense that even for these people, it's, it doesn't seem to be better than other forms of psychotherapy. And, and this is very important to reinforce, because with the media hype, people think that this is, going, this is much better than anything else, and that's not the case. Mm -hmm. 
but I mean, it's it's good that there are studies and proper studies showing that it's it can be as effective as other forms of, of therapy. Uh, I mean, curiously enough, for um, for stress, which would think this this would be particularly good, and Kabat-Zinn's first method of secular mindfulness was particularly directed at stress, mindfulness-based stress reduction. It it's, it doesn't seem to be as effective. The results vary much more, much more widely. Um, it the results for anxiety seem to be better. Mm-hmm. than for stress overall. Mm-hmm. So uh, you've also done some studies on inmates. Uh, I'm not sure at the moment if you used some sort of meditation technique or if it was really mm. mindfulness. But um, could you tell us about that? What were the effects that you were trying to obtain with them? Was it reducing their levels of violence or something like that and were the results mostly short short to medium term or did you also get some long term results ah okay so t- t- two different questions mm-hmm. so we were interested in looking it was um, a combined intervention in which we had yoga postures okay. and then some some meditation in the end it wasn't mindfulness it was mm-hmm meditation focused on the breathing mm-hmm. and 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 yes basically we're trying to see if this would reduce levels of of stress uh, would increase positive effect would also re- reduce levels of aggression in prisoners mm-hmm. so this was it was the first randomized controlled trial run in prisons but in in relation to the second part of your question um, it was not a longitudinal study, so we only looked at this. We looked at the effects within ten to twelve weeks. Mm-hmm. So we didn't. It's very very difficult to get into prisons, um, and actually, just to give you an idea, prisoners are moved around from prison to prison quite often. Mm. I, I have never quite understood why that happens, but at least in the UK, that happens a lot. They, they, they're moved very often from prison to prison. So we had to, to do a study of 10, 12 weeks. We had to ask the prison governors to not move these people while we were doing the study with them. Oh, otherwise you would have lost contact with them. Yeah, yeah otherwise it would be very difficult to, mm-hmm. to keep track of them. Mm-hmm. So we did find some some positive things. So people doing the 10 weeks of intervention did reduce their levels of stress, increase the levels of positive effect. There really were no differences for negative effect. And they seem to also do better on a cognitive task that is linked to to impulsivity. Mm-hmm. However, on the other hand, we didn't get any, any changes for levels of aggression. Mm-hmm. And that was actually one of the things that made me start thinking that hmm, perhaps the the effects of these techniques are are much more limited than than we're thinking than we're considering right now and so we we need to look more carefully into this mm-hmm. and just to um to add to that more recently we did a different study looking at actually we had we had two interventions. We had yoga on the one hand mm-hmm. and mindfulness on the other. And then we had um, just a control group. Mm-hmm. And we did this with people with personality disorders in prison. So all of them had things like psychopathy, mm-hmm. clinically di- diagnosed psychopaths. And we did this intensively, so throughout a week. Because there have been a number of studies showing that actually if you do this intensively for one week, you get similar results as doing it 20 minutes mm-hmm. twice per day for eight weeks. And we had a whole lot of measures from EEG to cognitive stuff, even um, genetic expression. Mm-hmm. And, and basically we didn't find any differences between the control group and the intervention. 
But in the case of psychopaths, were you also trying to maybe increase their levels of empathy or something like that? Or was it something completely different? We, we also checked for things like that. So we, we, we were, I mean, basically trying to see if, if this also decreased stress, um, if it made them, yes, I mean, work better with other people in a more empathic way. Uh, but we didn't really find that it did anything different from not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that we're talking about inmates because another very interesting thing that you refer in your book has to do with the connection between uh, meditation and violence and intergroup conflict or how some people uh, used meditation to promote intergroup conflict and you talk about uh, some examples from uh, in, from Asia I think it was Eastern Asia and you refer for example to the fact that it seems that it helps people avoid uh, self-responsibility uh, and uh, since you get into a sort of selfless and detached state of mind, mm -hmm. then you it can more easily allow for you to do basically anything. Yeah. So. so I was really surprised to come across this literature. And um, uh, for instance, someone that I talked to who's, who had just edited the book on Buddhism and violence mm -hmm. told me that... Um, he got very strong responses from Western Buddhists, not Eastern Buddhists. The thing is, I mean, we're already quite ignorant about our own Western history, right? So when it comes to the Eastern stuff, we're really, it's not just ignorance, we're really biased. We still have all these 19th century exotic ideas about how it is. So we think that, oh yes, yes, it's only Judaism and Christianity and Islam that have been religions that have stimulated violence that mm -hmm. within Buddhism there is no such thing and it's nonsense of course I mean there, there's been proselytizing of a violent proselytizing within Buddhism there's serious problems within Buddhist countries I mean right now in terms of um, I mean violence towards um, Muslim minorities for instance so there's all sorts of issues the, the work which which made me go deeper into this, um, by Brian Victoria. He's he's actually a, he's an American, but a, a Zen Buddhist priest right. and a, a, histor a historian of religious, um, of religions, particularly in, in the Far East. So he, he has written a couple of books and plenty of chapters showing how during the Second World War, the most prominent Zen Buddhist leaders in in Japan mm -hmm. endorsed the the military effort as something sacred. Mm -hmm. More than that, there were lots of monks teaching the military Zen Buddhist ideas and techniques to sort of depersonalize the soldiers mm -hmm. so that they didn't think of themselves as individuals. Mm -hmm. But they thought of themselves only in terms of of their mission, how they embodied this great spirit, sacred spirit of, of war. Th th there's tremendous examples that he's, he's put together of of this. And um, yeah, so, so I, I'm thinking that um, one of the great introducers of Zen Buddhism to, to the West, mm -hmm. oh goodness, I, I forget his name now, but... Um, he was also a, a someone who was an advocate of the war as something sacred, mm -hmm. which I mean, very very few people in in the West who read his books knew about. So he's he's come up with a very very clear case to the extent that when his books were translated into Japanese, mm -hmm. there was this outcry like, who is this guy? telling us that this thing has been used. But then, the very Zen Buddhist leaders in Japan came forward and said, yes, we know, we have known for a long time that this was true, 
and and we and we acknowledge that it is that this has happened and we're sorry for it. Mm-hmm. So even the very Japanese Buddhist leaders have acknowledged that they have mm-hmm. intervened in, in such a way to use meditation techniques for the promotion of violence. And just to add to that, within in the kind of the study of mindfulness, there's an ongoing debate about to what an extent you can use mindfulness, so secular mindfulness, mm. to promote violence. So, and the example given is that of the, the sniper, so the, the kind of the killer who is with the rifle, mm-hmm. just, and he has learned how to be mindful of his breathing so that he can shoot better someone. And just to add another final example, mindfulness techniques are now being used with the US military and with the British military. Mm-hmm. And and again there's a debate whether oh, this is just oh is this just a way to make them less stressed because they have to, to go to difficult situations? Mm-hmm. Or is it a matter of making them more a- not just more able to deal with stress, but to make them better killers when they have to be? Mm-hmm. Yes, that's all very interesting. And and I was just wondering if uh, meditation in this case could in any way produce the same effects that things like um, rituals and particularly the element of synchrony in rituals produce in groups of people. Because since in that case people are trying to... Uh, mobilize other people for war or for intergroup conflict, for example, um, that may be trying to synchronize their minds in some way or another would would produce that effect that they want. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a very very good question. So there's an. Inc- yeah, there, there's more and more studies showing that synchrony produces this really strong social bonding effect. Mm-hmm. Right. And we're not exactly sure how it works or why why it works, but we do know that it works. And it can be something as simple as just tapping your fingers at the same time. But, I mean, we know that if you've ever sung in a choir, you know that you feel really, really relaxed and, and well about it. So this kind of pleasant sensation, which is almost certainly triggered by a, a release of endorphins. Mm-hmm. And and we know that um, all, all these kinds of, of rituals, of thing, people coming together doing these things, they make them feel better. I mean, so think that rituals in small communities, they're usually enacted once per month, Mm-hmm. And it has a very clear function of making people, so dissolving all the kind of social tensions that inevitably arise, people live together, shit happens, right? Mm-hmm. And and then people come together, do the, the synchronized ritual, dance, and this kind of brings people back to, to kind of amicable state of being. So, so this certainly happens in religion. We, we're actually doing um, a, a huge field study which we're just finishing. We did it both in the UK and in Brazil, looking at different rituals from Christian to kind of Afro-Brazilian trans rituals, mm-hmm. looking at the precisely how it, it brings people together, it raises the, the levels of social bonding, and it is mediated by the stimulation of endorphins. Mm-hmm. So people think that these have been happening, these rituals have been happening for a very, very long time. I mean, much longer than meditation. Meditation was only developed when we had more kind of complex, larger societies. Mm-hmm. And and there were written scriptures, and then there were people who started breaking away from this and c- coming up, developing these, these techniques. Mm-hmm. But, but traditionally, they have been practicing groups. Right within right. monasteries, um, mm-hmm. essentially. So, and I can't, I can't give you the reference of a single study that has looked at the effects of meditation done in group versus done individually. But I, I would expect for the results to be stronger 
when done in group, precisely because there is this kind of bonding and synchrony effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, I guess that when people are trying to mobilize, for example, soldiers to war and try to convince them, let's say, to kill other people, to kill enemies, I mean, people have already studied uh, how things happened in the First and Second World Wars, and it seems that uh, it is only one out of five soldiers that really, in fact, uh, are able to shoot an mm. enemy or, or to kill or to kill another person. I mean, people are really resistant to doing this, to killing another human yeah. being, and then many people go through PTSD and things like yes. that. So I was just wondering if uh, bringing people to this uh, mental state of detachment from their mm. own actions would facilitate that kind of thing. I, I think that potentially, yes. Difficult to conduct an experiment. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think it's very likely to be the case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's now move on maybe to another topic uh, because you've, you've also studied in your work the psychology of belief and you have this very interesting paper that I read uh, where you say that uh, and I'm going to cite, you, uh, to cite you now, despite the large correlation literature on the stress buffering effects of faith, uh. under acutely stressful circumstances, reflecting on one's beliefs may not confer immediate benefit. So uh, what does that mean exactly? That even uh, under stressful circumstances and when people believe in in some sort of divinity or a god, for example, that might not have the positive effects that uh, people expect? Or... So, let me just go a step back to give the context for that. Mm -hmm. For the last 20, 30 years, there's been um, this growing literature, mostly coming from the US, trying to well, suggesting that religious religion makes people live longer, overall be healthier, uh, cope better with with stress and general anxiety and adverse life conditions. Mm -hmm. So this this has become a sort of well established literature. It is it is widely accepted mm -hmm. now. Some years ago, we were doing an experiment on the neural correlates of religious belief. Mm. And we had a group of religious people and getting them into a kind of religious state of mind by looking at a religious image that they were oh, familiar with. And then we had a control group of people who were atheists or agnostics. Mm -hmm. And when we were interviewing them, after the the brain imaging experiment, we realize that we have all these instruments to measure how religious people, what religious people believe in, how this affects them, but we don't really know what is it that is meaningful for the, the non-religious people. So we thought, hmm, let's, let's try to, to find out what, what is important and meaningful for them and to see if these beliefs may confer the same benefits to them as religious beliefs confer to religious individuals, right? So we did the first study looking at belief in science. Now, this, this may sound a bit odd, but science is a big thing in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's been historically a, a key culture where the principles of science have been developed, as we know. And, uh, and there's a huge market on popular science. People really are interested in this. This is something which is valued at the societal level by a number of people. So we got hold of, um, of people who were non-religious individuals, and we, 
we got them in stressful situations or situations which made them anxious. And we did a couple of studies showing that when these people became more stressed or more anxious, their beliefs in science increased. And other studies, like other studies, show for religious beliefs. So people cling on to their beliefs. Mm -hmm. And we generally think that this helps them alleviate stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that's why their beliefs are strengthened. Now, we thought, okay, now let's try to, to do this the other way around and check if in increasing their beliefs actually makes them cope better with stress. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, although there's this huge literature on religion and, and health benefits, mm -hmm. there's practically no studies looking at the effects of religious beliefs on acute stress. Mm -hmm. And acute stress meaning some, a moment in which you're stressed right now. Mm -hmm. And there's various ways of doing this. You can subject people to pain, that that's always increases levels of stress. Or something which is also often used is you make people give a public speech, right? So, so the exposure to other people and being evaluated I mean, works wonderfully. Um, there are things which work, I mean, generally well. I mean, if you deprive people, if you get people not to sleep for one night, I mean, this works also wonderfully. I mean, in the negative way. <laughs> right. Right? So we, we, got, we got a bunch of religious people and a bunch of scientists were not religious and they were doing postgraduate degrees in science. And we asked them to think about how their beliefs had been important for them at a point in their lives. And you get the kind of usual narrative, the religious person talks about going to, to church and praying and to feeling kind of um, held by God mm -hmm. and, and feeling safer. But we would also get someone doing a PhD in zoology who would say that, well, one important thing that I do when I'm feeling stressed or depressed or anxious is just to work out the tree of life and watch nature documentaries. I'm not sure what it is about this. It just, just makes me feel so relaxed. Mm -hmm. So we then exposed, we got people first to strengthen their beliefs, and then we exposed them to stress. And we're looking at heart rate, blood pressure, and cortisol levels, so the, the hormone that regulates stress. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really get the differences that we were expecting, right? So, so neither of the, the groups actually did better than the control group in which they weren't thinking about their own beliefs, mm -hmm. which led us to, to that citation you read that perhaps, although there's all these studies showing that religious people benefit from being religious, it's it's probable it's probably um, a long-term thing, something that develops over time. Mm -hmm. It's not that when you're very stressed at the time, that thinking that, oh yes, I'm religious and everything will be fine because God will, that this will inevitably help you cope with this mm -hmm. at the time. H having said this, we weren't checking, so we weren't looking at religious experience. If people got themselves into a deep, prayerful state or something like mm -hmm. that, which might have triggered something deeper in terms of biochemical processes. Um, so th th that would potentially be a, another way of looking at it, but that's more of an exercise. It's not really belief. So we were particularly interested in, in belief, mm -hmm. effects of belief versus um, non-religious beliefs. And just just to, to add something to that, we've just finished a, a very large project on understanding and belief, mm. where we've so we've looked at thousands of atheists and agnostics throughout the world, and we have all these curious ideas that these people don't believe in anything, they don't have any moral values. But again, it's just our ignorance because we have just never looked properly at them. And what happens, actually, the, the most surprising thing is that, in terms of what they prioritize in terms of moral values is overlaps almost completely with what the general population does. So family comes on the top of their list, mm -hmm. yeah, followed by freedom. 
Uh, but in terms of dignity of human rights, the value of nature, there's really no differences between being an atheist agnostic or, or being a religious believer. The, the study that you are referring to right now, is it the one um, where you also studied um, other types of beliefs that atheists and agnostics have, like, for example, if they believe uh, in astrology? Yes, exactly. Kind of, oh, okay, 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 okay. I, I read that, I read that. It's very interesting. So, uh, I, I mean, uh, the one of the conclusions that you got there by studying these atheists and agnostics over the world was that, okay, so maybe... Uh, they say or they in fact do not believe in any type of God but then when we're talking about other sorts of things like even for example certain pseudo-sciences then they fall for them right. yeah so so th that was interesting that so people who don't believe in it claim to not believe in anything supernatural so they would, I mean, it's it's a, 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 certainly a lower percentage than the general population, but between 10 and 20% of atheists, or atheists, not even agnostics, mm -hmm. would believe in something like the possibility of a post-mortem life, that there is life after death. And I think, how is that possible? So we did also interviews. And um, the way that is possible is that some of them believe that there is just some some kind of essence that lives on mm -hmm. it's it's not they wouldn't call it even spiritual but there is something some kind of a magic quasi magical essence that lives on then there's people who may believe in parallel universes so that um, no I don't believe in anything supernatural but I do believe in parallel universes so when I die here I can just be born in a different universe mm -hmm. or just move on to a different universe I, I, again it's very unclear how that happens but yeah and it's very interesting because those types of beliefs we usually associate them with religiousness or religiosity right? yes yeah yeah yes so, exactly so, so would that mean then that maybe uh, we should approach uh, religion or the study of religion uh, going on 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 a case by case basis that is analyzing belief by belief because I, I mean even when we're talking about religion different religions have somewhat different sets of beliefs and so I, I mean in that case yeah. in that case about life after death, uh, people would immediately assume that if someone is an atheist, then we would have to immediately exclude that belief from his set of beliefs, let's say. Yes. Yeah. Well, so, some of my colleagues who do cognitive science of religion, like Justin Barrett, whom you've interviewed before, mm -hmm. you'd say that something like life after death is, is something very intuitive. and. So there are some studies showing that in, even in China, that uh, people who would not believe in anything supernatural, when they're asked to think about situations where someone dies, right? So what happens to this person after the person dies? Does this person still have thoughts? Does this person still have feelings? Does this person still is, can get hungry? And so... Although people tend to think that the physical attributes disappear, in the sense that, no, this person will not be hungry or thirsty, they would s that there's a tendency to think that they would still think that this person is feeling something mm -hmm. after the person dies. Mm -hmm. But again, again, uh, it's, it's not the majority. So uh, but th there is still an interesting minority of people. Something else that happens is that there's variations in terms of atheism and agnosticism uh, across the world. So in, 
in countries like where there there's more religious practicing religious people like the US and Brazil there's greater differences between the general population and the population of unbelievers and the reason may be because they're they're more an, an exception to the rule mm -hmm. And is it, just one last question maybe, is it the case that um, unbelievers can also use uh, something like science to try to reduce uh, their stress, their anxiety, or even to provide a meaning for their lives? Or? Oh, so, yes, so, so we did that study. There's other studies showing that believing in science as kind of valuable endeavor is is something that people will cling on to that it's it's a system which gives meaning to people's lives um so i'd say that yes it, it can work as a as a world and belief system like religion for a number of people what what again we're missing are well, we're missing studies just to show how exactly that that works and how different it is from from being religious. We need more studies on that. Mm -hmm. But the evidence we have so far points that points out clearly that it is a worldview of its own that that provides people with meaning. Mm -hmm. So it seems that people in general cling to creating some sort of meaning to their lives and if they don't have something coming from religion then they could basically resort to other yes. sources and and people like carl sagan the astrophysicist who had that very famous tv show he he was one of the people advocating this saying that science per se can f is, is full of wonder because there's just so many wonderful, magical things that we get to learn about life and the universe. Mm -hmm. So we don't need religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that I've heard Richard Dawkins also saying how yeah. beautiful certain things that he finds through science are. Yes. And, and how those can also give meaning to, li to people's lives and things like that. So it's a common... Uh, common thing that many scientists out there, particularly ones that are uh, motivated against religion, use in their argumentation. Right. Yes, yeah, I, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Dr. Farias, just before we go, uh, I will be leaving a link to your book in the description box of the interview. Uh, what are the best places on the internet for people to find your work and the articles we've been talking about here, for example? So m most of my articles are actually on my website. I need to update it, but you can just get them for free on, on the website. If you just Google Miguel Farias, you, you'd you be able to, to reach it. Um, for the book, the book is on Amazon and there's... There's a few translations. So you're you're in Portugal, and there's um there's a, a Portuguese edition of it which has a different title. Um, Can you remember the title or, or something what? like um, "Pod a Meditação Mudalo" or no? I'll go see. I'm going to check it out. No it's worries. it's published by Leia Lua de Papel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, okay, great. So uh, I will be leaving all of that in the description box apart from the rest and links to your faculty page and website and things like that. So, and uh, Dr. Farias, again, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show and to yes. talk to you. And maybe in the future we could do another interview. I don't know. It was great to talk to you, Ricard. Hi there, thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. 
So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Uh, otherwise, I also have a PayPal and Subscribestar. And if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Iane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, and Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, and Ruth Gervois, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.